The growing number of good options out there when it comes to queer representation in film and TV has got me thinking about a time when we had pretty much nothing and about the show that heralded the start of the modern era of lesbian and women love women representation in TV. Xena Warrior Princess broke ground back in 1995 for coding a show about a kick-ass warrior woman and her sidekick Gabrielle as queer. So let's talk about the show, whether it's a classic, whether it's queer baiting and what the pros, the cons and the tropes of the show are. If you haven't seen it or are thinking of watching it again, I also have a watch order for the last four episodes of the show that makes so much more sense than the order it was aired in, so stick around for that. Representation of the queer community in the media has come a long way in the last 25 years. Back then, queer characters, and especially lesbian and women love women characters in TV, were all but invisible and certainly never seemed to exist beyond an episode or two. Representation at the time was almost exclusively found in films, and even there it had been a mere 10 years since the first lesbian film with a happy ending, Desert Hearts, had been released. And then came Xena. Xena was a show that centred around the journey of the titular character who was at a crossroads. She first appears in Hercules, The Legendary Journeys, in a three-episode arc that sees her going from being evil to good, thanks to Hercules. Eaten up by her guilt from the past, she appears to be ready to commit suicide or leave behind her past when the lackey of a local warlord arrives, having captured the village of Potidea. And then she sees Gabrielle. Yep. You see that right there? It's gay, pretty much from the first shot. After saving the village, starstruck Gabrielle invites herself along to be Zena's companion. You've got to take me with you and teach me everything you know. You know I'm sending you home in the morning. I won't stay home. And while the next six seasons follow these two gal pals as they journey across Greece and beyond to help the helpless and for Zena to redeem her evil ways. Queerbaiting is a marketing technique for fiction and entertainment in which creators hint at, but then do not actually depict same-sex romance or other LGBTQ representation. They do so to attract or bait a queer and straight ally audience with a suggestion of relationships or characters that appeal to them, while at the same time attempting to avoid alienating other consumers. This definition could certainly sound like Xena was queerbaiting, because although Xena and Gabrielle were coded as queer... What is it? Given the climate of the time, it was never explicitly stated that they were together. In every other way it could be, however, This is my soulmate. It was clear that they were a couple, and it comprised the heart of the show for six seasons, riding an incredibly thin line between subtext and main text, in effect serving both queer and straight audiences alike, who could interpret Zena and Gabrielle's relationship however they liked. While it may or may not have been the intention up front to create that subtext... You're not much of a girl talk, are you? And of course you're not like most girls. Queer audiences, attuned to snuffing out subtext like bloodhounds due to decades of censorship, were quick to pick up on it. It can only be assumed that the showrunners had no problem with this because in 1996, Liz Friedman, a gay woman, was hired and she wrote and produced a number of episodes, including Many Happy Returns, which has, without a doubt, one of the gayest moments of the series. By the end of the show, it was hard to argue that they weren't a couple, when they were referenced as girlfriends and soulmates and were indisputably a family, and the show had even had them touch lips, kiss essentially a few times in inventive ways that really had no heterosexual explanation. Well, I hope you two worked things out. We did. It's been acknowledged by the cast and crew outside of the show that they were a couple since as well. Zena and Gabrielle were a couple. It was, if not explicitly said, it was implicit that... um, Yeah, they totally were. The key to my mind is that far from being a switch and bait situation, far from trying to trick its queer audience into hanging around just in case they went canon, co-creator Rob Tappet and Sam Raimi were offering an opportunity to finally see something that felt like it belonged to the queer audience, even if the network wouldn't allow it to be. Was it frustrating to watch these ladies gay it up season after season without it ever being acknowledged in text? Sure. 
Did the show get to benefit from writing that line without alienating homophobic audiences? Sure. But it also gave representation to a minority that was starving for images of themselves. There was honestly next to nothing out at the time, which gained the show legions of faithful queer fans that are active to this day. It was a show that was limited by a homophobic culture and network, providing content that for the first time was as much for the sapphic ladies as for anyone else. The content creators weren't doing it to reel this group in, I don't think, rather to provide sorely needed representation in the only way they could at the time and trying to do it justice by having a queer writer producer like Liz on the team. It signaled the beginning of a change in lesbian representation in television with the shows like Alan, Buffy the Vampire Slayer and The Our Word following in the subsequent years. This is what, in my mind, makes it different from shows like Rizzoli and Isles and Once Upon a Time, notoriously queer baity shows that could have equaled Xena had they had the guts. These shows equally centred around two female protagonists with excellent chemistry, were framed in ways that encouraged a queer reading, teased the queer audiences both within the show and outside of it with the possibility, while never having the intention of making it explicit, and then went out of their way to insert male love interests in what felt like a cry of no homo. Incredibly, 25 years after it began airing, Xena remains unique in the landscape of sapphic representation for the simple fact that few shows, based off what I have seen, have created series that squarely centre themselves around the relationship of two queer women in quite the same way before or since. I'm talking about that dynamic that has been wildly popular in shows like The X-Files with Mulder and Scully, or Castle with Castle and Beckett, or Bones with Bones and Brennan. You know, that chemistry dynamite that is the backbone of these shows between the two undisputed leads, and that has that slow burn, will they, won't they, that builds up through the seasons. What we have seen is the slow rise of important but secondary queer characters in shows like Supergirl, Wyana Earp, Orphan Black, and Glee over the last few years. And I don't think it's a coincidence that two of the shows I've just named have or have had bigger fandoms for the subtext ships involving the leads than the main text queer ships that the shows offered. Somehow, I think, we are still yearning for a certain type of representation that we are only now beginning to see with the cresting power of online platforms that favour shorter, bingeable seasons with a single main story driving through each episode of the season that makes up shows like Ratchet and The Haunting of Bly Manor. While it feels like shows like these have opened up the opportunity to have better explicit queer representation because they're no longer having to cater for the masses of television, which often means catering to a more conservative audience, it does mean that the dynamic of Xena and Gabrielle is one that 25 years later I've really seen in an explicitly queer context. Depending on how Killing Eve progresses, it could be one of those outliers, but the closest I found, funnily enough, is on She-Ra, an animated kids show where the entire thrust of the five seasons hung off the ever-present relationship between Adora and Catra. Up until season five, this show was all subtext too, until in an event that surprised even the queer showrunner Noelle Stevenson, she managed to convince the executives to let it go gay. So yes, Xena is a sapphic classic. Now, while Xena may be a sapphic classic, it bears an overview of the pros, the cons, and the tropes. For if being in the woman love woman fandom has taught me anything, it's that we've been subjected to certain storytelling techniques enough that it bears mentioning. What makes this show so enjoyable even today is the relationship between Xena and Gabrielle. It's the strong and warm beating heart of the show. There were some great character arcs, fun writing, and a reverent campy spirit that allows the show to never take itself too seriously. As they travel ancient Greece and beyond, overcoming jealousy and crucifixion and death, well, sort of, to find their way back to each other again and again, they gamely skip through time as if it doesn't exist to take part in historical moments such as meeting Homer, Caesar's death, and the birth of Christianity in what is peak postmodernistic glory. While the show does deal with darker themes, it never forgets to laugh at itself, going as far as to create body-swapping present-day episodes and clones. While Xena's redemption arc is the underpinning thrust of the show, Gabrielle is allowed to evolve in a beautifully layered way, and there are some great arcs for other characters as well. It's a show that never stops being inventive with its mythology, cleverly weaving in the shift from the era of Greek gods to Christianity, and posing questions about existence and meaning in an engaging way. Also fun is that the sapphic subtext didn't just end with Xena and Gabrielle, there are other women throughout the series that intersect with the two in ways that could easily be read as queer. 
All of this helped the show overcome the elements that have dated it. So you have to remember that Xena came at the infancy of CGI and at that time they were quite proud of what they managed to do but it has not stood the test of time. Ugh, I mean what is that? So be prepared for some laughably bad special effects and dated cinematography. There is also a lot of suspect acting with bad accents which are meant to be American-ish but certainly are not. The battle is near. The Matones are just over the next ridge. And they're coming this way. To your ego. And a spear no less. Could you be a bit more obvious? <laughs> Bless Kiwi actors for trying, but no. Given the very specific niche it feels, however, a world of campy fantasy it doesn't detract too much once you're absorbed into the stories. The tropes. Ah yes. While some are delightful and very welcome, like the whole you are my soulmate, etc. There are some that are not. Uh, there are some pretty hefty tropes thrown into the show, so if you haven't seen it and don't want to be spoiled, skip this section. But if you do like to know what you're in for, here we go. The man inserted. You will have to suffer through the love interest of the week. They are mostly inoffensive and the relationship between Zena and Gabrielle are repeatedly affirmed, although Gabrielle does get married for a brief moment and the ensuing death of her husband does play out over the ensuing season. There is also an ongoing tension between Zena and Ares as well as Gabrielle and Joxa. It bubbles along in the background for the full six seasons. It didn't bother me particularly too much because it was very clear that the primary relationship was always going to be Zena and Gabrielle, but you know, just be warned. The pregnant lesbian trope. This particular version of the trope is more inventive than most. It involves Gabrielle getting pregnant via a satanic god called Dayhawk in season three, so Obviously there is no consent there and was deeply, deeply traumatizing for Gabrielle. It essentially signaled the end of her innocence. But having said that, the consequence of that pregnancy rippled through the show to ignite other major storylines that I did enjoy. So also to note that Xena did get pregnant via Immaculate Conception. Been keeping yourself busy? I wish I'd known you were looking for a father. I'm not. Oh? Well, somebody clearly got the job. Yeah, Gabrielle. I would have paid to see that. <laughs> prompted by Lucy, the actress, getting pregnant in real life. That also prompted some interesting storylines. But the one I'm about to mention has no excuse. Bury your gaze. Yep. At the time, there was zero awareness that the decision to kill off, so block your ears if you don't want to hear this, Xena uh, was done because the creators thought it was a fitting end to the redemption arc Xena had undergone over the six seasons to show how far she'd come from the warlord she'd been. It was also a horribly, horribly violent death in a two-part finale that didn't really make sense within the universe they'd built came pretty much from left field and left a lot of fans angry. Since then, Lucy, who had agreed with this decision at the time, expressed regret for not understanding what the ending meant to her queer fans. It has also since come out that there is an alternative watch order to the last four episodes that will sort that out and leave you in a place that is far more palatable. Look, I don't know how true this is, but I have heard that the order that the last few episodes were broadcast in was not, in fact, the order that they were meant to be watched in. I've only ever seen that one Tumblr post, and maybe you've seen it as well, talking about the different order, so I can't speak to how authentic the claim is, but if you watch the last four episodes in the following order, it actually makes narrative sense and works well enough to give the happy ending we all want. Now, while I like this order, I actually came up with an alternative watch order that I think makes even more sense than the one that we have just discussed. And bear with me, at this point, everything's a headcanon and, you know, live your best life. What this order does is it leaves you on a higher note than I think When Fates Collide offers you. It's kind of a bit weird at the end in the forest, kind of flat. I know that that was a direction that was given to the actors to do. It didn't quite work for me. So this is the order that I think that you should watch it in. First of all, you can put soul possessions in at any point in here. Start off with Friends in Need Part 1 and Friends in Need Part 2. Follow that up with When Fates Collide and then have many happy returns. By watching it in that order, you end up with one of the gayest moments in the entire show being the closing scene of the entire series. And you can still use When Fates Collide as that narrative way of removing the consequences of Friends in Need Part 1 and Friends in Need Part 2. 
What do you guys think? Does that work for you? It works for me. I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below. If you like this kind of content, like and subscribe. Until next time, lady lovers.